Ivan's calling miles away. Both heads are up. It was a very, very distant call, everyone. Sounded like one line. Sleepy line. Ooh. Which way is the wind blowing going? So they've turned their faces to the wind there. Maybe there's something out there. We're searching with the thermal camera. Is it easy to get to Zebu? Not the one sitting. I see. As opposed to the one lying next to them, trying to hide. They're looking over the top of the dead zebra in the direction of the dead zebra of the living zebras. Let's um let's have a look at the thermal camera if we can. Now, just if you are a new viewer, hello, that's me sitting there. Those are the lions. This is a thermal camera that picks up a heat signature from animals that have heat, and uh, well, that have heat. And strangely, that um that zebra still has heat and yet it is very dead, unless it is masquerading. Perhaps it is masquerading as a dead zebra. It is pretending to be not alive anymore. Uh, I'm obviously being completely facetious. It is very dead, but it shows you that it's not that, uh, the carcass is not that old. Then, those twinkling lights in the top left-hand side of your screen, them is the other zebra we think, and quite possibly mixed in with a herd of wildebeest. And that's what those lionesses are looking towards. Now, if you're wondering why it's a little bit jerky, it's because it's a handheld device being held at the bottom, at least at the back of the vehicle. What are those, Graham? Beefies. Uh, it could be buffalo, everybody. <laughs> Difficult to tell when you've got one pixel to, tell, to find what, our, what animal you're looking at. But these lions are now looking interested. Now, we've come here to the Mara Triangle, of course. We're hoping to tell the story of a lion-hunted night, a second lion-hunted night. Three nights ago, the pride, the Kichwatembo pride, hunted in the rain and driving wind, and they killed the baby zebra. It was the most fantastic experience. We've spent another two nights with them. One night, they sat doing absolutely nothing. The other, they attempted, well, one lioness attempted some hunting, but otherwise they didn't do a great deal. Then yesterday evening, we did spend... Who did we spend yesterday evening with? We started with the Kichwas. Oh, very tired, exhausted lion. And then we spent some time with some male lions. They also did a lot of sleeping. Anyway, we think that one of these prides is going to do some hunting tonight. If this lot don't do anything, and, I mean, they do have a dead zebra with them, so the chances of them doing too much, I guess, are pretty small. But they haven't started eating it, which I think is very strange. We don't think they killed it. We think it died after the effects of a river crossing, where a crocodile basically chewed a piece of its underbelly off, and its guts eventually came out, and we think it died here. Why they're not eating it, I'm not sure. They've eaten a little bit of it so far, and one of these lionesses looks like she's lactating to me. But I'm not convinced she's, ha she's given birth. I think she's got swollen teats, but to me, it doesn't look like anything's been suckling on them. They may have been killed by those intruding males. We don't know. But you can see they're not full. They're in very good shape, but they're not packed full of meat at the moment. A little bit of a stretch there. It's an interesting thought from Bree Bree May, who says, is it possible the lions might be sitting next to the zebra as a way of camouflaging their own scent before they go on their next hunt? Um, no, I don't think they've thought that far ahead. I think that they're lying here because they're thinking about eating it. But I also think that there's a very big herd of zebra with some lots of little zebra in it. Not very big herd of wildebeest with lots of little wildebeest in it, not too far from here. And we thought they may go and hunt them. They certainly watched them as the sun began to set. 
but this lioness looks like she's settling in for a bit of a feed now. And I think that's the older lioness, which makes me think that we might be wrong. So we'll sit here for another 10 or 15 minutes. Further up the road, we've heard rumor of males. We might go and check for them. They are, of course, the greatest scavengers out here, which means that they don't often do a great deal of hunting at this time of year. And then we might also go and check on our old pals, the Kichwatembo pride, up, unsurprisingly, on the Kichwatembo airstrip. Now, Brent Leo Smith, of course, is following the Inkahuma pride. They potentially too will hunt tonight, so that would be great. We'll have two lion hunts in two locations with any luck. So as we link back to him, I'm going to ask Jean Dre to tilt upwards, and I'll show you the twinkling lights of Angama Mara, where we are going to go and stay tonight, as we have in abject luxury for the last many nights. It's there. <laughs> okay, back to Brent and the Inkahuma pride. Oof, that's nice. So what I'm doing is I'm leapfrogging. I can't actually follow them with the lights on through the bush. Uh, what I've done is jumped up, guessed where they're going to pop out. And, mm. and then she had an enormous vomit. Now that is disgusting in and of itself, but it does rather support my theory that perhaps that zebra is off. It might not be such a tasty meal. And I wonder if the crocodile's rotten flesh-encrusted teeth didn't infect this poor thing before it d dropped dead here. It uh, can no longer see out of that eye. It is, however, still very warm, interestingly, and uh, we know that from the thermal imaging camera, which is also now, much of that zebra is out of commission, but uh, this one not permanently because it is uh, raining slightly. You may just hear the gentle pitter-patter of rain on the umbrella that our fearless leader is holding over Jean Dre, our equally fearless cameraman. The lions, however, having looked like they might get up and move, are now not looking like they're going to get up and move. But I do think it's fascinating that they're not eating the zebra. Let's have a quick recap, and then I'll just tell you quickly about the lions of the area that we've seen today. Earlier, we had reports of a pride of 12 down on the Tanzanian border. We didn't go down there because it's very far and there's no signal here. We could have given, gone down there um, if we'd had to or if we'd wanted to. There's no reason or no human impediment to stop us going down there. Then we saw those seven lions earlier, which unfortunately we wanted to open the show on, but a great big storm came in and made a mess of our signal, so we weren't able to do that. Those lions, apparently of the Serena pride, look like four lionesses and three young males. And we have huge action here at this sighting at the moment. Anyway, we left to leave them. They weren't going to hunt tonight. They were extremely fat. They've been eating substantially during this migration season in the Mara Triangle. Then we went down uh, to the crossings and our tracker in chief Peter Brat went up towards the Kitratembo airstrip where the Kitratembo pride were lurking. One of them extremely fat. He didn't manage to see too many of the others, but none of them looking particularly enthusiastically like they wanted to hunt. Then reports of three males in this area, and we're probably going to go and do a little fossick around and see if we can't find them. They may be on the hunt. We don't think they've eaten for a while. They certainly were looking, well, relatively well fed yesterday, but they weren't panting. Maybe those three are on the hunt, so we'll probably go in a few minutes to see if we can't find them, and we'll do a loop around towards where we can see the thermal heat signature of the buffalo and the wildebeest that we had earlier around here, and we'll see if they're not being stalked by those three males. We might be lucky, because I don't think... Uh, well, uh, I don't know what these lionesses are going to do. I don't think... I think they're pretty hungry, um, but they're not eating the zebra, and I think that's rather bizarre, especially given that that one has had a hard vomit in the last half an hour. Jen B, a nice one from you. You're wondering if, if I think that that zebra is too infected for them to eat. Would a hyena eat it? I might just put a caveat here. I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that the zebra is too infected for them to eat. 
I put it forward as the theory for why it has remained like that uneaten during the course of the day by these lions, and perhaps why it is that one of the lions was sick. I'm not saying that that is definite. The biggest and quickest way to get egg on your face out here is to say something definitely, because then lions and every other animal out here will almost always turn around and do the precise opposite. That said, do I think that the hyenas would be able to eat it if it is too infected for the for the um, lions? I, I don't know. They definitely have a more acidic digestion, but a lion's digestion is pretty acidic. You know, they've got a pretty pretty strong constitution. So I'm going to say yes, maybe, but I'm also going to say that if this thing did die of an infection, there's so much else for the hyenas to eat that were they to come across here and smell some kind of pathogen in that zebra, I think they'd leave it alone. I think they'd basically move on and see what else they could find. Nice one. Thank you, Jen. This is a fascinating theory from Carol in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah, Carol, you say, is it possible, you would have thought maybe, the metabolic heat of the bacteria consuming the inside of that zebra, maybe it died with an extremely high fever, and maybe that is what is contributing to the, to the thermal signature. Either there's metabolic heat in there from the bacteria, which I'm not so sure about, but maybe there is, um, maybe it died of a temperature and just doesn't cool down yet. That's a really nice theory. Thank you, Carol. The only th bits of it that have been eaten are a little piece out from under the tail there. That's where the lion who vomited was eating from, and then the ear off the face, and that the younger lion ate. She hasn't had any, doesn't seem to have had any ill effects. Ravi, another one from you about whether or not if this thing died of an infection, would a vulture be able to eat it? Yeah, I would say yes. You know, I mean, there's very little out here that rots away completely without being eaten. Um, so eventually something is going to eat the zebra. It's not just going to lie here, I don't think, and rot completely. So, Ravi, I would say yes, vultures are probably able to eat it. We know that they are specifically designed to eat the most rancid flesh in the world. So perhaps they'd be okay with it. Um, I mean, I don't... I think there are probably some very specific things in various animals and birds' digestions that um, allow them to eat various things that other animals can't. And perhaps vultures and even hyenas would be able to cope with the disease that the zebra had. And maybe the lions, not so much. So like I say, I think we're going to spend another five minutes here or so. And then we're going to head off north. See if we can't find the males or the lions of the Kitratembo pride. Are these two still fast asleep, Jandri? Indeed they are. Now we have spent quite a lot of time with flat cats, but that's simply because our timing has been such that the cats have generally eaten basically <laughs> as we've got to them. Like these two thought we well, these two we thought were going to with the zebra. But as I say, I think they look pretty hungry. Let's see what happens as we go forward. They keep smelling something on the wind. That's why they keep lifting their he heads, I think. Ooh. Ooh. What a pity it is we don't have the thermal imager. If the rain stops, we will absolutely pop it up. Sicky lioness has not picked up her head. She's feeling a bit low. There's no reason that lioness, if something comes along here, there's no reason she wouldn't be able to kill it on her own. As I said, lionesses on their own often kill as much or kill enough to eat as much, if not more, than prides that have three or four lionesses in them. I also think that there are males calling somewhere way to the east of where we are now. And sometimes she lifts her head and turns and you just hear in the very far distance, ho, 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 ho.
Right, unfortunately, it seems like the Nkahumas have also decided that life is rather too tough for them and they've decided to have a bit of a snooze. But Brent will tell you about that while we wait and decide what to do here. We found a lioness, everybody. We don't know what she's doing here, who she is. She seems to be stalking towards the others. And we've just done a sort of loop around. We found a herd of wildebeest going at high speed. Now this lioness looks like she's hunting to me. There were supposed to be three within this little pride. And let's watch and see what happens here. At least she looks like she's pregnant to me. Don't think it's one of the same ones. We've done a very small kind of loop from where we last saw you. Uh, she's smelling. She's smelling other lions. See the Fleming Grimace? For those of you who don't know what that is, that's the opening of a track to the organ of Jacobson or the vemoronasal organ, veromonasal organ, sorry. And what that does is interpret pheromones. You see how swollen she is on the belly. But again, no obvious proper suckle marks. Hooray. Well, we've got a lion moving. Let's follow her. We've also got Graham Wallington sitting on the roof. So quite possibly he will slide off. Hold on, Graham. I'm just going to turn around, keep, try and keep her in the infrared beam. She's stalking straight towards where those wildebeest were running, everyone. This is great. That's it, I'm afraid. We are now stuck. <laughs> no. Everyone, I'm afraid this is a bit of a a bit of a disaster. We came off road, we've gone into a rut and we are now immobile. Oh, uh, I can't make it move at all, Brian. Ah, no, man. I'm going to give it one rev, but I, I really think it's it's done. Yeah, we're on the diff. Oh, God. Okay, we're going to link back to South Africa. And let's try and find out what's going to happen here. We'll try and get ourselves out of here. Back to Jamie. Hopefully that line won't kill while we're getting out of here. Dear, oh dear, poor James and co. A very unfortunate for them. That very nearly happened to us a few times this evening with Tingana, so I completely sympathize. Not all that easy finding one's way around in the dark and then accidentally driving over or driving into a place that you shouldn't so I completely sympathize with them we've all been there done that right we're going to try and locate Tingana I think he's probably just moved off a little way and then gone to lie down but we're gonna try and see if we can't figure out exactly where he went this is one of his favorite routes he likes to stroll along this road and I'm hoping he might do that now he came in this direction Please, Tingana, come to the road. Aha, I see you. Yeah, I got him. Um, he's now going back in the same direction. It's just astounding while we sit here with the sleeping lions. Well, one clean itself. Who would have thought it? Well, I suppose everybody who loves the Ninkapumas. They have pulled it out of the bag and killed a buffalo here in exactly as we wanted them to, lion kills at night, how fantastic they have been. This bunch 
has been doing not a great deal. Um, since I last saw you, obviously we were stuck. Uh, that is not an uncommon occurrence for me. And what happened was, oh, sorry, we've got, <laughs> we're going straight back to South Africa. There's even more action going on. Hello everybody, sorry about the very quick link last time, but I'm not actually sorry at all. You've got to go and watch the little Linkahuma Cubs arriving at their kill, and well deserved it is for them indeed. Our cats, as you can see from the thermal imaging camera, are, well, very tired. But, just behind them, a herd of what Graham Wallington calls bogies. The bogies have the wind from blowing sort of from the lions to them, we think. You can't really tell. It seems to be swirling slightly. But that is the potential hunt that might happen here if these lions can bring themselves to just wake up and do something other than nothing. There we are. Two sleeping on the left. One under a termite mound on the right. The other one lurking about here somewhere. Now we think this is four lionesses. We're going to vaguely conclude that they might be from something called the Art of Africa Pride. It's been very difficult to figure out what's going on because every time we thought we'd figured out what was happening, two more lionesses would, dis would appear. I'm assuming that we're not very far from where that zebra died, so I'm assuming two of these are perhaps the two that were at the zebra earlier, then two more appeared as we got stuck, and then, of course, I didn't want to get my boots dirty, so we sent Graham and um, Tyler and John, Dre and William out to push the car out, and they did that very successfully. We then followed these lions, and they went to sleep, which is what they have done quite frequently here. I'm beginning to think that, A, they do quite a lot of killing during the daytime, and B, well, I mean, they hardly look like they're desperately hungry. So they do quite a lot of feeding during this time of the year and quite a lot of hunting during the day. But the Kichwatembo Pride, who knows what they're doing tonight? Who knows what the males are doing? We took a gamble on this bunch and, um, <laughs> well, it hasn't quite paid off like the Inkahumas have. But, you know, if you've got vehicles traversing the entire continent of Africa, as we have at the moment, you're going to find at least one pride of lions intent on finding themselves some supper. If that pride of lions happens to have eight little cubs to feed, well, then they're probably even more likely to go hunting than they would be in this rather prey-rich environment. Let's have one last look at the fl... No, sorry. Graham, can we have one last look at the fleur? Thank you very much. Let's see where the... Um, See where the other are. Uh, we're back on that herd of potential bogies <laughs> who are just twinkling very pleasantly off towards the east. <laughs> Hello, Lisa. A very good question from you. Um, you want to know how much time or how often I think these various prides in the Mara cross paths. Lisa, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I, I have simply haven't been here long enough to say, but I do think, from what we've learnt over the brief time we've been here, that there is so much, um, so much upheaval when the migration comes through, so much kind of uh, unusual behaviour when the migration comes through, that I would imagine it's quite difficult to pre to predict, because certainly the Kitra Tembo Pride. Um, I thought we, we've seen them as far. Have we seen them this far? Yes, we have. We've said, well, we haven't. We haven't seen them quite far, this, quite this far south. But um, I think they have been seen certainly this far south. And it would make their territories pretty small if they never came across each other. So I think it's rather fascinating. I don't want to put my um, head on a block, as it were, and try and guess what's going on here. But yes, they, they certainly could. Um, they certainly, they certainly could come across each other. But they do call a lot. You know, if you sit on top where we're staying at Ngamamara, you sit on the deck in the evenings, there's calling from all over this place. So maybe they, their territories shrink during this time of the year. It could happen with very 
sort of prey rich areas that could definitely be the case I mean maybe they get a little bit bigger and spread out from each other uh, when the wildebeest and zebra and Irland and Thompson's go, go, go wandering down south into the Serengeti. But I've got to tell you, it'd be wonderful to spend a year here and figure out exactly what is going on. And of course the only way you can do that is to spend an extended period with these animals. That one is alive, you can see there it's breathing. Aqua, a nice question from you about whether or not these prides have smaller or larger territories than the ones in the Sabi sand. From what I've seen here, I'm going to say they're slightly smaller. That would make perfect sense given the prey density here. The prey density here is, I would say, probably quite a lot higher than it is in the Sabi sand. At the moment, of course, we're in the middle of a drought in the Sabi sand, or it's just kind of broken, and so things are A, weak, and B, coming out of the Kruger into the Sabi sand because there's pumped artificial water. And so, you know, it's probably relative, you know, it's still not equitable even at this stage. So I'm going to say I think it would make sense that the prides here would have smaller territories. Um, the Nkuhuma prides territory is probably about 5,000 hectares, which is just over 10,000 acres. And... I would have said the prides here from what, I mean, this is based on combined experience of about eight days here. I would say that the pride territories here are probably, and I'm, this is a wild guess, but about four, th maybe three or four thousand hectares each. So between, say, nine thousand and eleven thousand acres. Now, whether that situation persists, when the migration moves away, I don't know. You see, I mean, in the Sabi sand, the uh, you know the prey situation is relatively stable throughout the year. Same number of impala and yala and kudu and buffalo and giraffe and other wonderful creatures that we get there. And then over here, of course, the situation does change. But the game is still thick on the ground during the rest of the year when the migration isn't here. There's topi. Um, there are, I think, probably some resident eland, probably some resident wildebeest and zebra. Um, plenty of um, buffalo still around, lots of giraffe, masses of warthog. There are impala here, and so I think still there's a lot to eat here. But maybe with the reduction in prey numbers, um, the lions spread out a bit. It would be fascinating to find out, I must say. And I've, I mean, I've tried to read up on all of this stuff before we got here, and there's precious little. And I don't think that's necessarily indolence on the part of the researchers. I think it's just simply that it's actually quite difficult to figure out what on earth is going on here. And I think only an extended period with the same lions could truly figure out what was happening. Then, of course, I mean, while I'm waffling on like this, um, there is the, the small matter of a pride takeover here. New males coming into the area. A couple of nomads coming up with the migration. Apparently Scarface brought two females into, or created almost the Kichwatemba pride by bringing some females across with him from the marsh pride. So, you know, I think things are also in a state of flux here at the moment. And maybe in a couple of months' time they'd have settled down. A bit like these lions, which have settled down profoundly. <laughs> uh -huh. Right, we've had some amazing action today, but the link I've just been asked for in the context of what we've had today has just blown my mind. We're going to go across to Jamie, who's got a spider on her dashboard. That live wildlife filming particular seem to be following the lions. They've got up and they're moving. I can't see them. Jandre, can you see them? Okay. Okay. More lions at 12 o'clock. They're on the move. Hoorah! Hoorah! Maybe they were just being polite and running now. John Reed, just give me a, a number. Straight ahead. She's jogging. 
have to turn these off. I'll just turn those on. It's too bright, isn't it? John, if you see anything in front of us, you'll let me know, will you? Otherwise, we're going to go into a hole. Oh, you think they're going to the carcass? Well, let's see. They might be heading towards that zebra carcass, everybody. In which case, well, it's not quite a kill. Let's follow and find out. What a night we've had. Just by the way, we were sitting here, of course, in the car with these flat kitties, and we watched quite a lot of what you were watching. And how amazing was it that the Ninkapumas and now their cubs. Oh gosh, we're back with the dead zebra here. <laughs> it promised so much. Done? Which lioness this is and why she started running here. So we we went off, everyone, to try and see if we could find whether there's a buffalo or wildebeest. They turned out to be wildebeest, and we turned around, and that's what we found. So if you have just joined us, this, this zebra uh, died, we think, as a result of injuries uh, inflicted by a crocodile during one of the crossings over the Mara River. We watched two lionesses eating it earlier. One of them then threw up violently, um, and then they kind of, we f drove off and we found two others, and they were shortly joined, we thought, by the two that were eating this zebra. Now suddenly, they're back here. We don't know why she threw up. We don't know why nothing is eating this thing. We don't know why that whole group of four lionesses isn't eating the zebra. It's all rather strange. And apparently the Vildes, as Graham is saying, are not too far off. We're at 4 o'clock, so you're looking at um, sort of 10 o'clock, uh, about 180 degrees behind us. And we'll just keep the, inf the thermal imager looking the other way at the Vildes, because if she's got up and she's from the same group of lions, which, I mean, I can't see why she wouldn't be. She's come from that direction. It's possible the others will get up and spot those wildebeers, as opposed to lie in the grass and do absolutely nothing. Now, this kind of situation, of course, where an animal dies of an injury inflicted either on it by crocodiles or perhaps by lions on a failed lion hunt, we know we've seen the Inkahumas um, who've become rather expert buffalo hunters. We know we've seen them fail before on a buffalo and leave it sort of walking around uh, injured. I think that happens here quite a lot. There's obviously so many animals here that they probably hurt each other when they do these great crossings across the river. And so a, a carcass like this, lying in the middle of a, middle of a clearing, um, sort of unattended, is not actually that unusual. What is unusual is that it has remained or that these lions found it and then left it again. Nice. One of them seems to have come up. Graham, no bogeys. I'm afraid my thermal imager is down. I'm going to, I'm going to guess that one more lioness slowly reaches... So Graham reckons one lioness slowly making its way towards us. You know me, I'm not one to guess. No, no, quite. Now Graham says he's not one to guess, um, but... Luckily, he guesses right most of the time. Now, I wonder if she hasn't smelt those wildies. That's where she looked off. The wind is in her favour, even though she's probably smelling the worst part of that zebra right now.
So we shared a couple of theories, everyone, as to why the zebra, why the zebra was left uneaten. One of them, <laughs> one of them was, of course, that it has become infected by the crocodile's foul, rotten meat, sort of in bespattered teeth. There's something else off to the left-hand side there, and maybe that made it sick. So the are you you not got IR? Thermal, sorry. Why are there no hyenas here? That's also very odd. There you can see something just off to the right hand, to the left hand side, top left. The lioness has seen it. This could be quite interesting. Hmm. Very interesting. And you can see the zebra, I would say, Graham, starting to cool there, wouldn't you? Yeah, it's fever making down. It's fever's dying down, yes. I mean, interesting that it was, I mean, it was as white hot on that picture as the lion was when we first found it. Now it seems to be cooling down as a result of being dead. Sally, you're in Oregon and wondering whether the zebra was still glowing. Well, certainly not with the flush of life and the views of the Mara, uh, and, but it is glowing slightly with the residual temperature of its recently ended life. But um, there that bogey, oh, we've got a pixel, one pixel off to the left hand side of the flare camera and um, it's now static. <laughs> anyway, we've got some lion action finally, it's good news. Not quite the lion action we'd hoped for, but that's what happens here, live wildlife television and brilliant that we've had a live lion kill during the special week when we'd hoped to have just that. We've had two live lion kills this week, one from the Mara, one from, well, nighttime lion kills, one from the Sabi Sand. And all in all, I think it's been a rather good return. It's a very interesting one for me. You say, uh, do I think that it's possible for the animals to tell how putrid or sort of diseased this carcass is simply from smelling it? Um, or do I think they need to probably taste it? I would have said they probably need to taste it. You know, they, they've got very sensitive noses, but they don't have anything like the number of taste buds we do, and they don't taste anything like the sort of complexity that we do, apparently. Um, so I don't think the taste really bugs them. They probably get a sense of toxicity, though. I mean, in the same way that many animals get a sense of toxicity, at least many herbivores get a sense of toxicity from the vegetation that they eat, and they'll avoid poisonous plants. I'd love to ask this lioness why she couldn't have been bothered to go and catch a little wildebeest. Mmm, that would have been delicious. Now, Brooklyn, age 10, just in case, obviously you weren't with us a little bit earlier. Brooklyn, that thing is called a cecum. Now, a cecum is where all of the zebra's digesting happens. So it goes through most of the intestines, which are the tubes that come out of the stomach, and they go into that thing called a cecum. And in that cecum, Brooklyn, there are a whole lot of bacteria. Now, bacteria, I will ask you, is a kind of little... I suppose you could call it somewhere between an animal and a plant. It's very small. You won't be able to see it. It's the same kind of thing that um, you know if you get a, a if you get a sore, if you get a cut on your body and it starts to turn red all around there. It's the same kind of thing that gets into there. But there are good bacteria and there are bad bacteria. And the zebra has got much much good bacteria inside the stomach there, and that bacteria helps the zebra to digest grass. And one of the reasons you can't eat grass, Brooklyn and why you have to eat things other than grass is that you don't have the same bacteria as the zebra has in its cecum and so that's why it's all that's that's what that big thing is there and it's so full because you see it's filled with gas and those 
bacteria make a lot of gas and I know that you have probably seen zebra running on Safari Live if you've been watching for a long time. Certainly we often see the zebra running close up in the Sabi sand and sometimes, well, we've seen them running a lot here and you know what they do when they run, Brooklyn. They often do what my dad calls let fly, which means they fart. And that's because of all the gas there in the cecum. So that's what that is. And you've actually got a cecum, Brooklyn. It's just very, very small. And it's called your appendix. Your appendix is just at the end of your large intestine. Now this lioness has seen, smelt, or heard something. Probably that small pixel that Graham spotted on the thermal imaging camera. It doesn't seem to be coming any closer. What direction is she looking, Graham? Sort of towards 7 o'clock. We can't see anything coming on the thermal camera. That little pixel seems. Hear something being killed, Graham says. Where, Graham? Let's keep her on the floor there, Graham. We just can't move her on, she's very close. Can you still see her, Graham? You want me to do it, I'm going to drive forward slightly. Something is being killed, possibly a buffalo. Let's move. And turn the lights on. That is really vile. Where do you think, Graham? What direction? Well, she's heard it, everyone. Don't sit down. Come on, go and find whatever it was. Okay, let's be quiet here for a second, everyone. We're going to give a hard listen. I can't hear anything, but we've got lots of ears on the car. So everyone's trying to listen. has left that zebra. Why? It's fresh food, you'd think. Can't hear anything at the moment, but she's definitely heard something. She's also, is she facing the wildebeest? No, she isn't quite. Walking back towards the where the other lionesses were. This is very interesting. Well, the only way to solve this mystery is going to be to follow her. So that, everyone, is what we shall do. Two o'clock. 12 o'clock. Okay, I'm going to put a bit of light on, otherwise we're going to hit something. There we are. Still at 12. I can't hear. 2.30. No, she's right here. She's right next to us. Just turn off here briefly. There she goes. She's now hunting the wildebeest, we think, everyone. We think we have a hunt on. Mr. Wallington is convinced of it. This is excellent. Let's see what happens. We're going to follow her just within the infrared range. And 
there we got onto the thermal camera you can see where she's going those are the wildebeest in the distance it's going to be a little bit bumpy seasick safaris briefly but there she is she definitely seems to be moving around them possibly losing using the wind gosh this is fantastic grief can you imagine safari life with two lion kills in one night have you seen that we've lost the flare somehow okay, I'm gonna go a little bit quicker right arm down so just to explain the numbers that have been called out I cannot see I cannot see what's going on everyone um, I am driving blind in the same way that a helicopter pilot, I suppose, flies blind with instruments. My instruments are Jean Dre on infrared and Graham on thermal image. One o'clock, slightly right hand down. Now let's quickly go back to Jamie. I think she's got something interesting. spotted Janet which is something I've been dying to get on camera I know you saw one with Taylor not so long ago I'm really hoping we can get this one oh, I wonder if there's gonna be Birmingham boys with them because if there was one within 10 kilometers increasing that's the thermal camera you can see she's walking towards the other lions happy to move Graham yep. they're all coming together now I can put out a little bit of light because they're not in a complete hunt yet. Gee whiz, that was just incredible. So Lady Macbeth, yes, a lioness can absolutely take oh, take out a wildebeest, um, probably an adult cow. Um, even, um, we, watched, we watched a lioness take out, well, an almost adult cow yesterday. Sorry, I need a number, guys. They win. Ah, oh, there they are in front of us. You just see them now. The edge of the infrared. And one on the right of us as well. Oh, they're all moving now. One at two o'clock. Okay, I'm going to go towards 11.30. Let's leave the one at two for now. She'll presumably join the others. Yeah, they're up and they're moving together now. All right, while we follow these lions into the night, let's head across to Jamie. She's got another genet. So the lions are now moving towards a woodland area where they seem to have heard something roaring or something calling. They had a full roar, which, uh, as far as our hunting goes, is not a particularly positive sign. But goodness, these mysteries that we are unraveling here, hopefully even further to be sorted what is yeah, just difficult to tell exactly what's on the thermal camera they're walking right towards a woodland that is below the ulololo escarpment alulolo can't say that word there were rumors of cubs in this area Let's see. Now, quite unlike the woodlands of Juma, we will not be able to drive down into this woodland because it is, well, it's basically a, uh, it's a sort of forest. It's a patch of forest. And we're keeping scanning, scanning, scanning with the thermal. Seems to have found something, yeah. Can we just move around the side? She's moving again. Something coming out of the forest. No, nothing coming out of the forest. No, 
and there was one of them going basically into the forest in front of us, this one following. Not sure where the other two are. Graham, any idea? Other, into, other two in front of this lot. This might be the end of our lion tonight. Need to be very careful going in here. Hold on tight, everyone. Gosh, what a night it's been. Quite something if Jamie could top it off with another leopard. They're calling again. They're calling. I'm just gonna I'm gonna keep going everyone. I would normally turn off, but I don't want to lose them. Okay, I'm just gonna give you a quick listen. Something has spooked them, attracted them, caused them to come and think that there's some threat to their territory down here. It could be the males, I don't know. gone into some very thick stuff here. I'm going to turn the lights on, otherwise we're going to get ourselves into trouble. Yeah, they're having a bit of a play now. Where's that one, John Reece? Sorry. 12. 12 o'clock. Keep going. That, everybody, is a rather substantial canyon in front of us, over which we will not cross. What a night. <laughs> it really does wonder what on earth they heard here. Marking territory, so something has alerted them. They heard something calling down here. They've come to mark their territory, that's why they were shouting, geeing each other up with that play behavior. Look at the heat coming off that bush that you marked. That's so cool. Let's have a quick look there, Jean-Dre. See, just behind her, that's the bush she just marked. Look at the heat on that. No wonder that zebra stayed warm for so long. There, what's that at the far end of the of the screen? Yeah. Wonder what that is. Yeah. Could be a doesn't look like a hyena to me. Might be. Goodness, I wonder what that is. Top of the screen, everyone. Whatever it is is running now and they've stopped. And still, in the bottom of your screen, that bush that she marked. I can still see it there, just moving on the top, top right. It seems to have disappeared now. I think, well, it looks like they're looking towards whatever that was. Are the lions at, uh, where are they, at, at 11 o'clock? I'm just going to swing the car slightly, Graham. I won't go forward, fear not. Do you see them at all? There they go. They're going off to the left-hand side. Jean, hello. You're in North Carolina. You say, which pride is this that we're watching? Jean, this, we think, is what is termed the out-of-Africa pride. Seems to be four lionesses 
might include two cubs. It's all rather confusing. Now, we started off this, um, well, this kind of five-day lion hunt with the Kitra Tembo Pride, four lionesses, we think maybe another one, not sure, and two young males, and then the three males that we've been watching, Morani, a famous member of the Four Musketeers who was around this area with Scarface, and two usurping blonde males. They've also been around here, and then this lot here. A couple of nomads we've seen, and we've even seen the great Scarface himself. But this lot, we think, are what is known as the Art of Africa Pride. That's rather fascinating. They've gone to sleep there on the ridge down through the dip. Ah, and they're continuing to move down there. Something attracted them, everyone. They were on the hunt briefly, then they were sleeping, then suddenly they were up and calling and coming through here. Maybe they've got cubs here. Maybe they heard another lioness calling, or maybe a male lion calling the other side of this woodland. It seems to be a natural boundary between them and um, possibly the territory off to the south. We're facing pretty much due south now. But who knows? Well, it's a great honor to be learning all of this stuff from one, one of the most beautiful places I've ever experienced. I hope you've enjoyed it with us. I'm sure you have, especially as it has been trumped tonight, I suppose, by the Ngohumas and their cubs and their big buffalo meal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hello, Rain. You say there's you, you're 16 years old, and you say the lions in the Mara seem to be uh, different in their behaviour, in that they just seem to frolic around a lot. They don't seem to be do you know they kill their animals and then they don't eat them. Rain, I think it's very much a f not a function of the fact that they behave differently here. I, you know, if you were to drop the Inkahumas here, I think they'd behave in very much the same way. Um, I think it's just the fact that we're in the migration season. There's a lot in the way of prey around here at the moment. It's almost like a sort of three-month festival that they have, and everything's excited. There are wildebeest and zebra and Thompson's gazelles leaping across the river every day. They're coming into the clearings at night. Some of them are just dying of natural causes. It's like a real bonanza, smorgasbord of things for these lions to eat. And I think that's why they're behaving very differently. Toss in the pride male takeover, those two blonde usurpers coming in, kicking out Scarface, making friends with his brother Morani. Well, I just think it's got all the makings of a great, great story here in the Mara Triangle. And that's what's going on. I don't think biologically these lions are behaviorally different from the ones down south that have just fascinated us all by killing that buffalo and then bringing their precious little cubbies to have a meal with them. I believe one of them was sleeping on his food. Terrible habit, that. Yeah, nothing, nothing on the thermal there in the trees. You know, if a leopard had called here, there has been a leopard calling here tonight. I don't think these lions would have reacted. I think it's another lion that's come up from the other side and possibly called once. And these guys thought, no, 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 that's not going to fly. Phew. <laughs> Chandra, you've got no sight of them, hey, outside of the, f outside of the infrared, at least the thermal. All this technology is so deeply confusing. In the background, we can hear some hyenas calling. All right, well, I think we're going to have to turn around. Gra Graham, did you see all four go in here? No, we've only seen the three. Yeah, we've only seen the three. Anyway, we'll go and see if we can't find the other one and maybe do a brief turn around, see what else there is. 
and will catch up with you once you said goodnight to Brent Lear Smith, who I'm sure was beside himself with excitement at the Nkuma kill today. Right, everybody, what a day it's been. We're just going to go down the road here, down Graham's favourite slippy, slidey road, onto the main road and just check because we've found one more bogey to have a look at. And given that this is our very last night here in the Mara for this particular uh, sojourn in East Africa, let's just go and have a quick look at what it is. Not too quick, because if we go too quick on this road, this Land Rover will lie on its side like one of those lions. What a wonderful, wonderful experience it's been here. I'll just tell you my impressions as we go down the road here. We'll be about five minutes, I think, and then we'll say goodnight to you. Wow, to be in a place like this with the endless landscapes, colors that you just can't believe and pop out that no photograph will ever do any justice to, vistas that likewise no photographs will do any justice to, Three o'clock bogey, sorry everybody, I'll try and be poetic a little bit later once we've stopped talking about bogeys. Do you want to go off the road here quick? Let's go have a look, see what the bogey is. Try not to get stuck again. It'll be a, it'll be a great injustice for me to get stuck at, again at this late juncture. There's quite a lot of water down here. Anyway, as we move towards whatever this thing is, just the diversity of life and the sheer abundance of it has been overwhelming. And I've got to tell you, once or twice I've been left fairly watery-eyed by the things we've seen here. There's been terror, tragedy, triumph, little Thompson's gazelles being smashed by crocodiles and other tiny little ones making it across the river. And the endless cycle of the migration, the wildebeest and the zebra going to and fro across the river. Well, that looks like an eland to me. What is that? I think it's a boki. Looks like an antelope, everyone. And we'll just keep going. For now, with one last look at it. Any ideas, anyone? Two o'clock. It is a reed buck. <laughs> We're going to leave the reed buck alone. And you're all asking me what my favorite moment was. Uh, well, you know, uh, you're also saying thank you for the experience. Um, I think my favorite moments, everyone, have, has been, have been sharing it with, with you, learning with you about this amazing place and seeing things that I'd only ever seen on TV before and didn't really believe that they existed in reality, to be honest. And that I think the crossings are probably my highlights. But as I said to somebody yesterday, they asked me what were the most amazing things that I saw. And for me, I think it's been the sheer space. Endless, endless vistas, different every direction you look, a plethora of life in every direction, and that whole general kind of thing has been the highlight. Of course, the Thompson's Gazelle crossing yesterday was probably my highlight. With the, again, the tragedy of it and the triumph of the little one that got out, made it out, found the rest of the herd, and went off happily. Unfortunately, it's going to have to cross that river again at some stage during its life. Let's pack it in, everyone. I think we're into what might be described as the law of diminishing returns. We'll just quickly look down onto the road there. Can you see anything in front of us, Graham? No bogies. A very small bogey. It's probably a sleeping, rattling cesticula. And we'll probably leave that one alone for the evening. <laughs> All right, everyone. That's going to be it from us. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Um, oh, sorry, I've just unplugged my phone. I can't hear anything going on in the final control. Rebecca, you're going to have to give me more than 30 seconds to get through uh, all I have to say. Because, uh, you know, I don't, I don't talk very much. Um, 
Right, I'm going to firstly say a big thank you to jean Dre for his astounding professionalism. You have no idea the work that this fellow does over here. He really does work very hard. A huge thank you to William the Ascari in the back and his, um, well, biblically named colleagues who helped us out during the last four nights. A massive, massive thank you to Angama Mario for putting up with us. We've got Tyler with us today. He's down in the cockpit here. He's been extremely patient. He's about the same size as Jandre and, and Graham, so he's been stuffed into this tiny little cockpit, which was built for somebody my size. And a big thanks to him and his incredible team. If you ever come to this part of the world, that is where you have to stay because you will be overwhelmed by it. Mostly a huge thank you to all of you, of course. A huge... <laughs> Shut up, Rebecca. Let me speak. This is an emotional time. I'm going to pull you out if you're not careful. Um, and... <laughs> Big thanks to the Final Control for their efforts, of course, and to the uh, other guides at the Juma. They will also have experiences like this one day. But mostly to all of you for coming along the ride, because without you, of course, coming to these absolutely spectacular places would be utterly impossible. So thank you for coming with us, and we hope to bring you back here sometime soon. Until then, Rebecca, you may now cue the credits. I think she has cued them. Cue them now. Okay, we now have 30 seconds for me to waffle slightly further. So I will say to you again a big thank you for coming with us, and I hope that you will come back with us at some other stage. Who knows when that will be, but it's been a great pleasure, and we'll see you later. Bye-bye.